Hello, everyone. This is David Lee with Philosophy POV Game Philosophy, and we have a special another collab with Nairbeg or Brian, um, who has gone to my Master's of Arts program in the Social Sciences. He's a great friend of mine, and he knows philosophy and psychology and existentialism, and is a big Devil May Cry fan. I have not personally played these games, so how about you introduce yourself, Brian? Brian. All right. So... Hello, I am Brian. Yeah, and kind of as, as David said, yeah, we went to the same master's program together, so that was uh, that was fun. And uh, yeah, not to show you kind of already covered a lot of the ground. I but um, I'm a big fan of existential philosophy, and I quite enjoy Jungian psychoanalysis uh, as well. And yeah, and I've been a big fan of Devil May Cry series for quite a while. Actually, yeah, growing up, I used to play Devil May Cry three a lot. That was my favorite entry in the, in the series. And uh, I've wanted to play Devil May Cry five, but I uh, didn't. Haven't gotten too much of an opportunity to do that. But uh, I did enjoy a little bit of it when I when I played it a bit. But uh, yeah, and I'm a big fan of the lore, so I'm excited to talk to this little analysis. It's gonna be fun to talk about it, and I'll be I can you know provide some uh, interjections about the actual lore and the shenanigans that are going on in the plot line if it helps. But yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to this. I think it'll be fun. Yes, and again, I know I'm based. I mean, I'm not as much in existential, even though I've now read a lot of it. Um, but I'm into psychology, environmental stuff, um, and philosophy, and happy to in Jung. So we're happy to talk about this. Obviously, I'm the guy that if you've heard me talks a lot about Nietzsche, which I'm sure that'll come up here as well, which Brian also knows is Nietzsche as well. So um, without further ado, I, I, one last thing, I'm also a trained singer, so I will give performance notes as well and try to give some musical background um, to this, but not too much musical theory. All right, without further ado, Devil Trigger! Some of them, I guess, but just making it a little louder. What do you think about that, Brian? I'll endure the exile. Well, it depends on what we're being exiled from, I suppose. I'll have to think a little bit about the lore for why he would be in exile, because this is Nero's theme, so. I mean, isn't, I mean, I suppose exile, general... isn't exile just the sense of being a, de a, de a demon, the exile from heaven? Well, actually, there's not as much of an emphasis on demons as exiles from heaven in the lore of Devil May Cry. Uh, demons are, as far as I recall, just entities from this hellish world, just hell. And uh, I don't. There's actually not a lot of mention of heaven at all in the Devil May Cry universe. One mm -hmm. possibility, though, that you'd bring up that could be relevant here, though, is that he is Nero and also Dante and the rest of them. They're all exiles, perhaps from polite society, we might say, on account of them being part demon in some sense. So. Uh, that's one possibility. I can see that being uh, a way that it goes. Although, actually, mm -hmm. for, for Nero's case, it's a little bit trickier to say because um, in, in the first time he's introduced in Devil May Cry 4, he is mostly human, but then his arm becomes a demonic arm, and that becomes like a, a, a little curious point for him because he grows up in this uh, community that's oriented around a church that worships a demon. So it's, it's a very curious uh, little situation for him. I'm not too sure how that factors into him being an outcast. In the, in the time of Devil May Cry 5, though, he no longer has that demonic arm because it's actually been cut off by a mysterious assailant who then goes on to become the main villain of this game, Urizen. And um, I think, generally speaking, the exile could just be in the sense of, oh yeah, he's not exactly, like, a, he has a weird relationship to his humanity because he's not exactly human, per se. And uh, yeah, that's all I can think of for the, <laughs> off the top of my head. But yeah. And remember, you can stop it, Brian, at any time if you feel like there's something you want us, you want to stop it. All right, sure thing. It feels the ambience of it. Feel the ambience. Mm hmm. Mmm, the hype. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So with that that first intro, what do you think about that? So yeah, I, I suppose that the main kind of takeaway seems to be the, uh, the idea of pent up aggression. But I think that mm -hmm. the um, 
the thing about the double trigger concept, and actually, I don't know if I want to talk about it, but yeah, well, not. we can talk about it now. The concept of the Devil Trigger and the lore of Devil May Cry, and perhaps a lot of listeners would be familiar if you all are fans of the Devil May Cry series, but as a game mechanic, is basically you activate it once you've uh, either taken enough damage or you've given out enough damage, and there's a meter that builds up. And then once the meter's sufficiently built up, you activate it, and you go into like a special Devil Trigger form in which you are constantly rebuilding some amount of health. Your attacks are faster and do more damage. And uh, it's a really fun game mechanic, especially if you need to turn the tide because you're getting your ass kicked, which frequently happens in the Devil May Cry series. Um, but then in the terms of the actual lore, it's quite interesting because it's unique to um, people who are like half demon or portion demon. And they, uh, in the case of uh, the main characters, Dante, Virgil, and Nero, the devil trigger is, a, it signifies the aspect of their nature that is demonic. And so mm -hmm. it's, and that aspect of the nature that is de demonic is, uh, you know, it's powerful. It's usually wrathful and it's like uh kind of a tumultuous kind of power. And, it's, and the interesting thing about it is that it is inherited from uh, their kind of, kind of father. For, for Don, it would be Dante and uh, Virgil's father, uh, who's Sparta. He's a, a demon who turned against the demon king Mundus and did a whole bunch of shenanigans. But the fun thing, I think that does add a little bit of an interesting uh, twist to, or nuance to things, because then it means that the double trigger is not just the aspect of the psyche that is aggressive, per se. Mm -hmm. it, it is that, but it is that in tandem with the inheritance from the forefather in some sense, which mm -hmm. I think is it adds an interesting nuance to matters, which perhaps we can continue to deliberate about as we work our way through the song. But that's just one point that I think is worth uh, considering for now. All right. All right. Cool. Wait, actually, first, first, I do want to oh, yeah? give though performance notes. Um, oh yeah, go minute, ahead. Yeah, performance. This demon, like, you could hear, again, the aggression, the pent-up aggression going a little bit further again. This demon inside me has a hold of me, pushing his Gotta let it out! Gotta let it out! Gotta let it out! It's like, there's more, like, you can just hear banging. Like, there's a part of the psyche that's just banging further. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Oh, but now, yeah. Actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, sad. I would note, like, so, the fun thing about the stylistic difference between Devil May Cry 5 soundtrack and then, let's say, Devil May Cry 3, and actually also Devil May Cry 4. I think Devil May Cry 5 is probably the first one to go in the slightly EDM direction. But like in, the, in Devil May Cry 3's soundtrack, and maybe you'll do a, uh, an episode on Devil's Never Cry, which I would personally be very, very uh, happy to we're be part of that do, too. We're gonna, do, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna this, be a lot this, of fun, this, I think. This is outright confirmed. This is outright confirmed. I just, I All right, probably yeah, should, beat Devil May Cry I should beat Devil May Cry I should beat Devil May Cry 3 myself first. Probably. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that, that might take a bit of time. It, the game is hard as hell. But yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, what I think is interesting is that stylistically for Devil May Cry 3, like it's it's growlier and it's, I think it's more of a metal kind of sound. Actually, um, Subhuman DMC5 is a little bit more similar to it, though I personally prefer Devil May Cry 3 soundtrack. But there's similarly that idea of like um, kind of growly aggression, guttural kind of shenanigans going on. And uh, stylistically, this one is a little bit more clear voiced. But it does share in that aggression element, and thematically, both of them share in that idea of the internal capacity for aggression and violence, and so on and so forth. But except, so. except then we get now we have the female voice, which I believe of all the four Devil May Cry character battle themes, this is the only one that has a female singer, and maybe the only one in the series that has a female singer. Actually, I think um, uh, I think V's V's soundtrack. I think his theme also has a female singer, female vocalist. Okay. Okay. But, uh, yeah. And then, then, I guess, but what about the contrast, though, between the female singer? Since the female singer is primarily the main, the main, the main part of it, right? Mm -hmm. is, is that possibly in, sort of angelic? I mean, it's not angelic female. It's just hype female. She's just a hype, like, mm -hmm. EDM female. But, like, I guess, what do you take from that? <laughs> <laughs> just the phrase, a I mean, hype EDM female is funny. I mean, I mean, it, I mean yeah. it's just, um, it's, it's, a, it's a pop dubstep dance feel, right? It's sort of like a so, sort of yeah. I mean, I, I will say this actually. That you mentioned an interesting note about some the possibility of a singer being angelic versus demonic because I think that actually really shows through really nicely in Devils Never Cry. So when we get there, we can keep that thought in mind. Yeah, no, that's because Devils Never no, Cry. That, that that is actually Devils Never Cry actually has that. It was like I thought is this yes, sort of exactly, like that yeah. as well? Is that sort uh, of? Like the... I'm not too sure. I mean, I don't really know because in the case of Devils Never Cry, it's more clearly kind of angelic and choir sounding. I think. Uh, for this one, this, I don't this think this one might this one might that. just be the there still might be the anima versus the animus, like there might be. Ooh, like, that would be interesting. Like um, I mean, I mean, it's like this. I mean, like she's not reserved, but she's like like the the male voice is the aggressive. Uh, uh, well, well, this well, 
I mean, this is not less, that's less of the, it's more of the aggressive masculine versus the, versus the more just open, expansive feminine. I'm not really too sure. I don't, oh, actually, one, one thing that might be worth noting that, uh, let me see, I think, I don't really know if this is relevant at all, but uh, I think out of the three main characters of the Devil May Cry series, uh, Nero is the only one who has a healthy relationship to a woman. <laughs> like, uh, like uh, he has um, Kyrie, and she's like a, Wait, well, what, 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 what about is, is, is don't they don't they have like a, don't they have like an armor person that that get, that gives weapons? I thought she's in the series. Nico, yeah, yeah, Nico. Well, Nico is only in, in actually. She's not in the uh, previous ones, but yeah, Nico is also more, more Nero's friend than she is Dante's, and um, oh, okay. and yeah, so Nero's the only one who seems to have like healthy relationships with women. Like he's, he's like yeah, he's uh, like he has Nico as a good friend of his, and of course he's uh, either dating or married to Kyrie. I can't remember if they're married or not in the fifth one. And Dante has uh, notoriously bad luck with women. Is is part is a little in joke. And Virgil is um, like <laughs> he he's kind of got this sort of <laughs> he's he's incredibly edgy. They're all edgy in their own. Ways, what I really like about the Devil May Cry characters, but he's got like this sort of um, I don't even know how to describe it exactly. But he's very standoffish and cold, basically. So. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if that's of any interest, uh, but it might be relevant in some fashion. I don't really know. All right. But yeah. The funny thing, though, is that it's still saying it's the same theme. It's like instead of like the actual demon, they're like, I, but there's sort of like, the, it's sort of like, because it's again also just higher pitch in the voice. That is sort of like it feels like actually this is more of the the, the the rational part of the self in a way instead of actually that the male is the more instinctual and the feminine is the more rational. I can't like I can't. Well, it's still the, like it's like I mm. sort of hear in this the vocal range a little bit that there's like I can't seem to control all this rage that's inside me versus this demon inside. But like it feels a little different mm -hmm. in the sense, right? Yeah, but um, it's an interesting question about what, like, what perspective is the song being sung in, right? Because I'm thinking um, it doesn't like if we break it down into like the classic Freud model where you have the uh, you know the super ego and then the rational ego and then the id. It kind so of so feels it's kind of it's, it's, it's I I think I think the female is the ego and the super ego while 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 the well the well obviously the ma the masculine voice is the id feels like it's I'm not too sure about super ego per se, but I do think that it's from the perspective of the I, right? So the one that I intuit to be me, which I believe is the ego. So then it's something like uh the ego on the cusp of being of recognizing that the id is about to break through, let's say something like that. Um right. although whether another devil triggers necessarily the id is a bit tricky to say because uh, mm. and that kind of goes back to the complexity of the devil trigger being not just aggression but also the inheritance of the forefather. So mm. that's some interesting things to consider. I mean, here it's but, the father uh, which is Freudian. That is Freudian. Oh yeah, I mean Jung also Jung also has stuff to say about the father, but yeah. I would oh, Jung so. oh, just Jung just Jung just just puts everything into a nice uh, bouquet. Um, but Born in the abyss. Born in the abyss. Well, hey, you want to get a little Nietzsche in you think, or what do you think? Yes, always. <laughs> always a little Nietzsche. In. Well, let me see. Um, born in the Abyss. There is an interesting thing about Nero's lineage when Earth, because um, is Nero well, Dante's bit, son or is he separate? He's not is Dante's he... son, but there okay. is a twist to his. Would you like me to tell? I mean, the viewers would probably know, but would you like me to tell you because I know that you haven't played through the games yet? Well, but, yeah, just tell me. All right, sure. So Nero is revealed to be Virgil's son unexpectedly. Which oh, is funny okay. because Virgil does well, not. So I, knew, I, knew, I knew it was someone's son. I knew it was someone's son. Yeah. Well, obviously he's someone's son. Everyone's someone's son. David. No, I'm kidding. Anyway. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, he was a son of a character that's relevant. That's why I remember it. It's yes, Virgil's son. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just joking around. Yeah. But, but yeah. I mean, cause it's just kind of funny because Virgil does not. Virgil either gives the impression that he uh, that he's kind of uh, not super sexual in nature or he gives because he's he's kind of like. Um, he's very reserved and cold and kind of uh, not the kind of person you'd think would uh, be uh, out there, like, fucking. <laughs> but yeah, and, uh, but yeah mm -hmm. so Nero's revealed to be Virgil's son. And it is an interesting point because Virgil is a much more like uh, morally ambiguous character than Dante. Because right? Dante, even though he's a bit rough around the edges, uh, not, well, he, he's kind of a, a bit of a wild card, but he's a, ultimately a heroic figure. Uh, Virgil is one of the main antagonists of the third game. 
and uh, he's also implicated in the fifth one in a rather unsavory manner. So it does complicate the inheritance that Nero is uh, born into as the son of Virgil. So that potentially is one angle that we could have. That's, so that's, how, Nero, so that's how Nero gets his stuff from Sparta. Okay. Yes, and he's the grandson of Sparta, basically. And uh, and actually, one fun note, actually, if on that on that is, subject, isn't isn't there isn't there, scene, for, isn't there a scene in Devil May Cry Five where Nero fights Virgil? Yes, that is the climactic duel, and it's pretty badass. But yeah, so Devil May Cry Four, the uh, the double trigger that Nero has in that one visually looks like a. Uh, well, actually, I know that you're a huge Persona fan, so I'll use the Persona um, illusion. It looks like a Persona because like it spectrally kind of hovers over his body. And uh, for me, I'm a JoJo fan, so I would say it looks like a stand. But whatever. And the uh, the spectral yeah. figure that hovers over him actually looks very, very similar to the Devil Trigger of, of Virgil from DMC3. And so that's supposed to hint that, yeah, the Devil Trigger that Nero has in hand is from Virgil. So that's a, that's a fun little point there. It actually changed... He gets a different Devil Trigger in, D- in the climax of DMC5, which yeah, is quite yeah, interesting, yeah, yeah. too. It's blue, It's blue, right? It's blue. Yeah, well, it's actually blue in both cases, but yeah. Uh, and blue is also usually the motif of uh, Virgil anyway, because Virgil has a blue color scheme, Dante has yeah. a red color scheme. So yeah. it does signify that his lineage is from Virgil and... That's a certain kind of abyss to be born into, considering that Virgil is uh, <laughs> not a good at, person. The, he, at best, he is an absentee father, but at worst, he is potentially inadvertently a mass murderer. So you know, it's a it's a whole vibe. But yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah, I think I think I I, th- I think that I think that further shows that this is the ego well, versus the end. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And actually, if we which, like... Which actually, goes, which goes into... back to earlier Freud. That goes back to earlier Freud, because only later Freud started implicating the superego, um, which Lacan mm. was, like, against. It was like, screw the superego. No, just early Freud was aware of that. <laughs> okay, yeah. I actually don't know very much about Lacan, so that's an interesting point. I don't know uh, either one thing much we... about Lacan, but yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. One thing that could be of interest here, by the way, for the lyrics is the, the vengeance aspect. Because exactly. in DMC5... The uh, the thing that starts off the story from Nero's perspective is some some guy walks into his shop and then just rips his arm off and he's like what the fuck and this is his demon arm right the arm that was demonic from DMC four uh, which is also like you know a sign of his inheritance of uh, from Virgil but yeah this mysterious figure rips off his arm and then just and then the arm turns into the uh, the Yamato which is the, a uh, the katana that um, Virgil wielded so it was his sword uh, <laughs> so I just thought of uh, an Freudian angle it's his dick but yeah anyway. Um, so, and then his figure walks away, and his figure uses the Yamato to become uh, this powerful demonic uh, figure called Urizen, which comes from a book called The Book of Urizen, written by, uh, gosh, I can't remember his name, uh, William Blake. Yeah, William Blake. Oh, William poet. Blake. Okay. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, actually, DMC5 has a lot of William Blake references. But anyway, um, so that's sort of the vengeance that compels uh, Nero here, right? He's going to go off and stop Urizen because Urizen ripped his freaking arm off. And uh, what's interesting here, actually, is that if we get to the idea of, actually, it would be something kind of like castration anxiety, actually, because especially if we take, I was kind of joking about it earlier, but if we take the idea of the sword as sort of a a symbolic phallus of some kind, and I mean phallus not literally in the sense of dick, but in the sense of the the individual's faculty to uh, kind of enact one's will. To enact will, yeah, exactly, to enact will within chaos. And... um, because what, cause what's it later revealed is that Urizen is actually the uh, disembodied devil for part of Virgil. So, uh, yeah, so basically what happened was the figure who wandered into the shop and ripped Nero's arm off was actually Virgil after having been wounded in past defeats in previous games. So he comes in, he rips off uh, Nero's arm, and then he uses the arm to, uh, to you know, separate off his weakened human self so that he can attain his full power as the demon king Urizen. And uh, so what's going on there essentially is rather similar to the uh, uh, archetypal devouring father, right? Because the archetypal devouring yeah. father is the, uh, the king who refuses to cede the throne to the son, right? Because it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut your dick off to protect my dick, basically, is, <laughs> is roughly what the devouring father signifies. Mm-hmm. And in this case, that kind of symbolic castration happens in the form of ripping off Nero's arm. And so part of this is Nero going off to try avenge his, uh, to enact his vengeance against what is later revealed to the be the tyrannical father. devouring father. Yes, exactly. The primal, the primal so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very right. psychoanalytic shenanigans happening. I thought it was very exciting. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
do, do. Just the EDM. It's just good EDM. Yeah, it's a good vibe. Yeah. Just buy them. I feel like, yeah. My feeling. Just like sort of feels like this sort of inner hyper ecstasy and inner tension. Inner ecstasy. And then we'll hear with the next lyric. Oh, 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 oh. All these thoughts running through my head. Right there, I'm on fire. Yep. I mean, that this, this, in and out right yeah. there, right? So what do you think? Yeah, well, that? his arm. Uh, well, so I mean, if you want to get the, the, all the voices, uh, all, these, all the thoughts running through my head and such, I mean, I mean, I suppose that would be like the classic kind of, you know, the, that the mind, that the internal components of the mind are not altogether clear to our conscious selves and that there's a lot of stuff building up in there. And in this mm-hmm. case, it's uh, gonna, gotta let it out. I suppose, I suppose that'd be the, uh, the stuff going on here. Uh, yeah. Arm on fire, right? Yeah. But I was knowing, yeah, arm on fire, his arm got ripped off. He gets a Nico. Oh, that's an interesting thought, actually. Let me think about that. What's Nico signifying all this? Um, is she, is she what the animal? Is she the animal? She the animal? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. Well, she's a female character, and as far as female signifies the animal, which I don't know if that's always true, but probably yeah, isn't. N- but N- Nico's maybe. just a vibe mechanic um, character. She's not really the animal, yeah. Right. right. Well, I mean, here's, here's well, there's an interesting note because I'm thinking now, what happens in the aftermath of someone's symbolic castration at the hands of the father? In this particular case, he they, they go towards well, the woman. Gets, they, 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 I mean, I mean, we think about the Wolfman, right? The Wolfman hmm. dream. Actually, could you elaborate? Could you elaborate on the Wolfman a little bit? I'm actually not as I don't know how mu- I don't know how much this really relates to the Wolfman, um, because because the thing about the Wolfman is that according to Freud, which I think we all disagree, uh, many people disagree with about Freud. Is that he actually that the basically the, the Wolfman the person there's like there's a there's Freud's first Russian patient was a royal who had a dream when he was four about seeing seven six to seven white wolves and and they were seen to be the father because all because animal phobias are of the father um so he desired to return to the father but the way in which still even though Freud didn't say this he still said that 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 his sister made advances on him and so he had inset oh. some, in, yes that it, and so really it's what I, I mean the way i put it in the paper is that it's all really about the sister not about the father None, nonetheless i mean mm. so, i mean i mean freud still says that that you go after the mother but you can well this is just going after a woman though this is not even going after i don't know why i mentioned the wolf man but well i mean i mean he's still repressed i mean you were still repressed in sort some sort of female interaction and freud would say all interaction and lo- it is is really just sexual desire. So, well, uh, yeah, and if, well, I will note that also Freud's idea of sex is not the literal sense. But I, I'm curious about. I don't think necessarily that's. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel like uh, Nero like, that the help Nero gets from Nico is like um, some indication of like a pathological thing necessarily. But it, I feel like it's. Cause I'm trying to remember now. In it's more young, it's probably more Jungian, right? It's more in the sense of Jungian. Yeah, I'm thinking. That yes. the father has been replaced with 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 a healthy balance with the anima. Possibly, I don't know, because he gets a um, a replacement dick over that is arm. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but yeah, he gets a replacement symbolic dick from from Nico, and it's and it becomes a really fun game mechanic in DMC Five because you can do all kinds of really cool stuff with the metallic arm. Because he like he's, you can get different metallic arms, and you can yeah. try out different potential metallic I arms. There's like and, Mega Man, Mega there's Mega Buster DLC for me. If I yeah, remember. they just they, they straight up put in Mega Man, which is really fun. But I mean, you yeah. try out different arms as you uh, kind of, and perhaps that signifies something like in the aftermath of one's symbolic castration, one must what build up and fortify one's kind of own uh, form of that, and in that process of fortifying your own. Uh, well, Dick. would there, would there in, be anything, uh, man, there be anything for Melanie Klein, maybe? Because, I, I mean, obviously Jung would just go generally go away with anything about castration. Well, not... Hmm. Jung, I don't know. Well, what about well, what are you supposed to be the Klein kind? Well, what are you supposed to be the Klein kind? Well, you, you know more about Klein than me. I mean, I know, I, mean, I know a little bit about object relationship theory. I'm not too sure. I don't really recall what Melanie Klein would say about um, so maybe, 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 maybe castration. Jung, Jung would probably still add that I mean, yeah, Jung would still say if there is a symbolic frustration, then yeah, it would be replaced with some anima figure, which would, yeah. Because hmm. what I'm thinking here is that, it, like, from my understanding of like and the gameplay and all that kind of stuff, it seems like what Nero is doing is you know he gets to try on these different kinds of uh, potential replacements for his lost arm. Different, and, one, 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 uh, one and you different do... personas, or you could say like, well, like the different hey, ones. maybe. <laughs> 
Well, 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 maybe. I mean, he doesn't, I mean, it, does, it does impact your style of gameplay differently as you play based on what kind of arm you have at the moment. And as you go throughout the, throughout each level, you can collect new arms and switch out arms. It's really fun stuff. And, yeah, I mean, um, it like different possibilities for the self, which is what Jung is all about. Like, Freud would, yeah, limit, it could be something like that. would limit you. Like, Freud thinks, yeah. well, I think. And what's really cool is that by the end of the game, actually, and then before right before the climactic fight, Nero like uh, his he actually regains his his original not his original arm but an arm of his own basically, and it's actually quite cool because the arm that he gets is not the same arm that Nero, that Virgil ripped off right because it's not the demonic arm exactly. It actually looks like a human arm, but with that new human arm comes his own unique devil form. So in some sense, it's almost like the process of individuation that, away that, from that, being. Like, that seems perfectly like the individual exactly. Yes, I think that that's a, that's a kind of individuation. So. Which is actually quite interesting, right? Because you start as the individual, as this, as a son, right? And then the father, like the tyrannical aspect of the father of the paternal archetype, uh, symbolically castrates you. And then the game then becomes a process of trying out and discovering new kinds of uh, ways to manifest your own, like what has been symbolically castrated, and eventually it results in developing your own unique, uh, new like masculine phallus. You told you told you told me the song was not about the father, and it's implicitly implicitly still about the father. Implicitly, yes, because it's more about the son who has been symbolically castrated by the tyrannical father, I would say. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Let's continue. That's Nietzschean and Jungian right there. <laughs> yeah. Leave me alone, Mom. I'm integrating the shadow. You know? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Literally right there. No more. Right, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna break the shadow. Exactly. Oh yeah, and you know if we wanna if you wanna talk about like the um <laughs> I mean bang 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 pull my double trigger feels you, like you, a, you uh, know that sounds sexual yeah it does sound sexual yeah which I mean if we're talking about the symbolic phallus then I think that works together quite nicely mm -hmm. so you know yeah no I I just didn't want to say it I was like. <laughs> <laughs> So Jung, Jung would say that 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 means that, that that if your witness is consuming you, then you, if you're completely consumed by shadow, then no more hiding in the shadows. That means I can I that I've integrated, I've turned darkness into light, right? Well, I, I, it's a bit tricky to say because like uh, the, the idea of the shadow, light, light, it's not light, light, but it's like what, yeah, tell mm -hmm. me what you think about it. Oh, do you mean light in the sense of it is now aware to your, it is now like saliently there? according to your yeah. conscious like you can now yes, yes. okay yeah i think that's probably fair yeah because i think that right now like if we're talking about the idea of the shadow being actualized in some sense there's two possibilities right either you integrate it properly and you orient it towards something that's actually you know good and like properly healthy and so on and so forth or yeah you, you end up in a state of shadow possession right in which and that's probably what's described here as one of the myriad possibilities as you're contending with the internal shadow in this case the shadow that is filled with vengeful desire to uh mutilate the father because yeah. actually, actually, yeah, my, now is probably a good place to mention. In the climactic duel against Virgil, the reason why Nero's fighting him is not is that by that point it's no longer to avenge himself. Because what's happened is he's learned the full lore of of his father Virgil, and he learned about the feud between Virgil and Dante. And so he's actually he fights because he wants to interrupt the fight between Dante and Virgil. That's why there's that really famous uh, image, right? Of he comes in in his devil form and he interrupts the dueling devil forms of Dante and Virgil. And so what he's doing then is actually fighting to get his father to like uh stand down basically and Wait, so in some sense I, I, actually... I thought the i thought the image is dante interrupting the nero and virgil's fight is that not it? oh it's no it's, it's it's the other way around yeah it's interrupting Dante's fight and so yeah. in that sense because what he wants is he actually he doesn't want to kill his father by the end you know, he comes in he interrupts it because he doesn't want to die and so it's actually quite an interesting like uh thing going on there because then it's you know there's a possibility for vengeance as one of the responses to symbolic castration or there's the possibility of what something like desiring some manner of redemption for the uh, the tyrannical father figure because what who V is like because V is one of the main characters of DMC five as well and Nero and V kind of uh, they their missions kind of run parallel to each other and what Nero is trying to do and what Nero, what V is trying to do is he's trying to uh, he's actually the discarded human component of Virgil when Virgil first splits himself into Urizen because uh, Urizen is his demon form and then V is the human remnant that's left behind by Virgil. And so then V is going there to try and reunite with 
uh, years in and go back into becoming Virgil. And Nero kind of helps him along there, although he doesn't realize that V is actually Virgil. And um, essentially, it's a bit it's a bit up in the air for exactly how Virgil's redemption kind of goes around. And it's, a, it's still a bit hard to say whether or not he is fully redeemed. But the after Yurizen is defeated, V successfully reunites with uh, Yurizen. And by this point, V and Nero have traveled together for a bit of time. And Virgil is, a bit, is uh, you know, back to being his classic kind of uh, sort of ambiguous, uh, ambivalent, not amb- yeah, his ambivalent kind of uh, character where he has both potentiality for evil and potentiality for some manner of goodness. And in the mm-hmm. end, Nero's kind of fighting to try and uh, get him to stand down from his feud with mm-hmm. Dante to try- and some man- manner of redemption, I think. Mm-hmm. So it does nice. seem like, yeah. Well, that, that, I mean, that, sounds like, stuff. that sounds like shadow integration directly between V and Yeah. And, and like, yeah, that's also, yeah, that's also very pleasant. Yeah, I mean, something like that happens sort of in uh, Persona Three. Um, in the in the answer, Persona Three, something like that that happens. So that's interesting. Um, All right, I'll take a word for it because I, yeah, I, I never finished yeah, Persona yeah, Three, but yeah. No, well, I haven't even shown you the answer yet. So <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. The the answer is the epilogue to Persona Three. All right. Ooh. Well, what's about the Jungian sim- symbolism of the flame? Because the flame is, is I mean, in, in, I mean, you, in, in, from the secret of the golden fire, the ra- flame is like soul, it's rationality, but this is definitely like hellfire flame, right? This is like this, the bestial flame. I would say, yeah, I would say it's closer to bestial flame rather than rationality. But it is fun. If you know, it's fun to consider the ambivalence of the image of fire. Just generally speaking, uh, yeah. As far as I can tell, in this one, it's more about like the uh, beast of motivating fire. drive, the wild fire, yeah, specifically the wild fire. Drive. Yeah, the beast of fire. Yes, so yeah, we... I would say so. All right. Oh, actually, quick. Sorry, I'm gonna pause real quick. Yeah, of course. Uh, the storm pause. imagery. I, I just realized because uh, you know, bury the light, right? Uh, Virgil's theme in DMC Five. We're gonna. That will be next. Yes. Well, that we'll do that next. Oh, excellent. Well, then you'll find out when you get there. But the ref- approaching, and the image, and there's also a DMC three where, uh, like, uh, one of the other villains remarks to Virgil, "Storm is approaching," and so on and so forth. So that's kind of fun. Where, like, you talk if you liken the um, the inherited devil uh, in Nero to the storm that is also Virgil, then that's kind of it's kind of a fun little uh, symbolic continuity, I think. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. we can keep it going now. This also just sounds like a trauma, like the red. This sort of feels like. Uh, well, I'm talking about this with Hellfire and Guilty Gear. But like, it sounds sort of like a like war trauma in a sense, like feeling just in in red, constant desire to like fight and attack people. Y- you know, but like, ah. maybe, does that sound sort of like war trauma? Like everything is red. Interesting war trauma. I hadn't thought of it from that angle before. Um, what do you think about that? Hmm. It might depend on the particular kind of war trauma we're talking about. If there is a shared element of, in both cases, being uh, you know, symbolically castrated or emasculated in some sense, then perhaps, and then the, the vengeful uh, rage to try and uh, correct that, then maybe, mm-hmm. maybe there's some aspects of it. I'm not too, again, I'm not too sure about the kind of war trauma you're talking about, though. All right, got it. So it's sort of I'm constantly in night, right? I, I accept the completely accept and integrate the darkness in me, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll have to see how how she finishes sentence i don't remember what the line goes how the line goes so. all this is freaking phallic oh my god <laughs> well yeah i mean it's about a guy who's on a quest to uh oh god sorry about that i just left all the way to the back no but i was just remarking like yeah you know it's a, it's a man on his quest to regain his fallen dick you know that's what's going on. Anyway, back to it. Here's a little weird refrain. That was like sort of like more inner contemplation. Hmm. Yeah, I see it.
Now it's building up, it's pent up. Oh, now we're back to the more id sound. You can hear it going, all oh, these voices inside my head is like, it's like going up but again, like the imagery of going up higher in the voice is like, there's just like screaming out, it's screaming out or a notion of like, sort of like slightly going higher a little bit, like in the self, like the self is rising. Does that make sense? I think, you know, that's it. That is interesting because there's a kind of erupting kind of motion to it. Yeah. Which is kind of fun if we think about it. I, I, sorry, like this is, I mean, actually, you know what, why not? Yeah. The song does have like a certain, like, uh, cause you know, pull my double trigger is sort of a, and frustration is getting bigger. There's some man's about to. Oh, okay, I don't know if I. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, I don't know if I want to say it out loud, but there, there's a certain there is a sexual element aspect to it, I suppose. Or, like sexual aspect to like the the rhythm of how it's rising and eventually explodes, kind of, you know. Yeah. Um. I, I, I won't. I won't get any more uh, explicit than that. But yeah. <laughs> you know. Anyway. Yeah. Um. And and I think that is partly perhaps that's part part of why they uh, they chose the kind of EDM style because if I. And EDM, yeah, EDM, has wrong, that, you know, EDM has that feel of like it does have that. Yeah, sort of like, like the the beats about to drop, you know, like it builds up and then it explodes, kind of. I think that, that probably, as far as I understand EDM, which to be fair is not a whole lot, that yeah, seems like that's roughly kind of what's going on. Yeah. So uh, it maybe if that, anyone, it does have that club yeah. ecstasy feel. It just feels like you're on ecstasy <laughs> in your, your club. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been on ecstasy, so I cannot. Me, I've never know, been on maybe. ecstasy. Either. I've never been on. <laughs> okay. But, okay. Yeah, no, viewers, on ecstasy. If any of you have been, been on ecstasy, it's ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Anyway, Let's anyway, continue. on that note. Getting bigger, bang, bang, bang. Oh my devil trigger. Yeah, let's. Do you want to stop there or are we playing the rest of the show? Oh yeah, uh, let, 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 we, can, we can vibe our way out. Let's vibe our way. Out. <laughs> it's fine then. Um, we don't need to. We don't need. Um yeah, I, either either way. Um, <laughs> I, I, either 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 way. Um yeah, let's. Kind of got continue. blue ball there a little bit. Oh, never mind. Here we go. Yeah. Well, this this was good. You can listen to the rest of the song on your own. Um, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess I guess Man, you're, you're, you're blue balling me here. So. Yeah, I, I, either way. Um, but yeah, was this fun? I think so. Yeah, fun time. All right. Uh, well, do we have any closing think, remarks? What do we think? Like, I guess yeah. What else do we think about the song? Well, I guess in summary, right? It appears to be uh, man got his dick, his symbolic dick cut, got <laughs> his symbolic dick gets chopped off by his dad, and now he's off on a uh, mission to avenge his fallen dick. And along the way, he will discover his own dick. And that is the story of individuation in uh, psychoanalysis, generally speaking. So there you yeah. have it, I guess. The uh, power of the dick. All right. The power. Well, <laughs> yeah, we'll, leave it, uh, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, well, yeah, this has been, we'll do Barry the Night Lex. We'll see whenever I can get Brian back on, but I hope you enjoyed that. All right. This has been David Lee with Philosophy of Video Game Philosophy. Peace. See you later. <laughs>